Search and Seizure, presented by Group 2. Search and seizure can be defined as a process where authorities that suspect that a crime has been committed initiate a search of one's property and seize evidence connected to the crime. The Fourth Amendment states, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. The Fourth Amendment was established to protect the rights of citizens from subjective searches. The Fourth Amendment requires authorities to act within a reasonableness standard when initiating a search and seizure procedure. Public school officials must act in efforts to provide a safe and orderly school environment. When school officials deem a situation as dangerous or criminal, they can perform a search without a warrant. In contrast to this, when a situation does not pose a danger to the safety of the school environment, school officials must involve law enforcement and obtain a warrant before carrying out a search on school premises. History shows that many unwarranted searches held up in the core of law due to establishing a reasonableness standard. School officials are obligated to establish and maintain order and discipline within the school system. At times, when the order and discipline within a school are threatened by a suspected criminal act, school officials must act, which may include performing a search and seizure in order to diminish the threat. The Fifth Amendment states that a person shall not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. What does due process mean and protect? Simply that states must afford certain procedures, i.e. due process, before depriving individuals of certain interest, life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. Essentially, due process gives every person, and this includes students, the right to be heard before actions and or decisions are taken that will deprive a person or a student of his or her right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Dwight Lopez was a student at Central High School in Ohio. He was suspended in connection with a disturbance in the lunchroom in which some of the school property was damaged. Lopez testified that he was not a party to the destructive conduct and that he was only a bystander. A federal court agreed with Lopez that he had a right to a hearing. School officials appealed. However, on January 2, 1975, the Supreme Court affirmed the decision of the three-judge panel by a 5-4 to four vote, saying that under the 14th Amendment, People cannot be denied liberty without due process. Lawyers for the school district had argued that there is no constitutional right to education, so due process does not protect against suspensions. This statement is not in support of what Ohio law states. Ohio law states that free education to all children between 6 and 21 shall be offered. The lawyers for the school district would further say that due process only applies if a student suffered a severe loss. The loss of 10 school days was not, in their eyes, severe. The court disagreed. This is why, in 1975, Gosby Lopez became a landmark case on public school and due process. Drug testing is a new issue for the courts that came to light in school districts across the country during the 1980s at the beginning of the War on Drugs. According to the New York Times, in 2001, they estimated that hundreds out of the nation's 60,000 school districts required some form of drug testing. And again, the drug wars during the 1980s introduced this idea of mandatory suspicionless testing in the workplace. And after spreading from the public to private sector, the trend reached public high schools in limited form. 
meaning that they focused on testing of student athletes in the late 1980s. Throughout several court cases, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld suspicionless drug testing for students in 1995. The court had previously decided that the privacy rights of public school students are different than those enjoyed by adult citizens due to the fact that they are students, and in these cases, student athletes. In 2002, the Supreme Court heard a court case that originated from a school district in Oklahoma. The Potawatomi School District adopted a policy requiring middle and high school students participating in competitive extracurricular activities to undergo random drug testing. The students and parents challenged this policy on the grounds that it violated their Fourth Amendment rights and did not address a special need for testing students who participate in extracurricular activities. In a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court decided that the policy did not violate the Fourth Amendment. They upheld that the policy presented a reasonable means of furthering the school district's important interest in preventing and deterring drug use among its students. There are several implications for not only the Potawatomi School District, but other school districts as well to pay attention to in regards to the decision of this case. The court concluded that the school district provided sufficient evidence of drug use by students participating in extracurricular activities. It also stated that urine analysis was not overly intrusive and supported the school district's practice. Zero tolerance policies were instituted in the 1990s. While they were meant to be deterrents to such acts as Columbine, they have not proven to be as effective as anticipated. However, there are ways that zero tolerance policies can remain in place, but with reforms to mirror the needs of their schools and communities. The expertise and experience of teachers and administrators should be taken into consideration when implementing zero tolerance policies. This would allow for flexibility when needed to fairly and justly enforce the policy in question. Zero tolerance policies should be clearly and carefully explained to the students, faculty, and staff of a school as well as to the community supporting that school so that there can be reasonable expectations for all involved. These policies should be frequently reviewed and evaluated for their effectiveness. They may need to be amended to best serve the school district that is enforcing it. Administrators have the difficult task of enforcing zero tolerance policies. They have to do so not only with the well-being of students in mind, but also with the understanding of the repercussions of their decisions. By not allowing administrators to have flexibility in carrying out policy that is often created out of fear rather than need, they are placing administrators, students, and communities in uncompromising situations. The case of the paring knife incident is just one of many examples of how leading without conscience or common sense can actually do more harm than good. This case demonstrates how policies can actually lead to greater mistrust and dislike of a system of authority, rather than showing how good guys can finish first by simply doing the right thing. The paring knife is a symbol of how one simple mistake can change a person's life forever, the smallest of blades leaving the deepest of wounds. School leaders have the responsibility of balancing student rights against maintaining a safe and orderly school environment. Therefore, one of the positive outcomes of court cases such as New Jersey v. TLO and Goss v. Lopez is that leaders have a framework upon which to base searches and seizures. This is important as it provides consistency for school leaders and for students. In addition, by providing structure to the process, the two-pronged test strives to protect student rights as much as possible and does not permit school leaders to infringe upon these rights without first determining the scope of the search and second, determining if a reasonable cause for the search exists. Another positive aspect of these rulings is that students have the definitive right to due process and cannot be disciplined particularly if the discipline results in the loss of educational time without first having the opportunity to present his or her account of events. Finally, due to the ever-changing nature of society and school norms, school leaders must remain up to date on current cases and policies regarding searches and seizures. 
For example, as technology becomes more and more prevalent in the schools, it is important that school leaders understand how technology use impacts these policies. It is essential that school leaders stay abreast of updates and changes regarding current search and seizure policies. It is vital that school leaders communicate these changes to teachers, staff, parents, and students, and educate them on how these changes impact the rights of all stakeholders involved. While the laws regarding search and seizure policies have had several positive effects on schools, they have also created negative consequences. First, with the implementation of zero tolerance policies, students who commit minor offenses receive the same consequence as a student who commits a far more serious offense. This generalizing of disciplinary action results in more students missing school for suspensions and expulsions than necessary. In addition to periodically reviewing the search and seizure policies, it is crucial that school leaders evaluate zero to tolerance policies and their penalties on a regular basis. In addition, school leaders bear the burden of showing reasonable cause in a search and seizure situation, and he or she must act accordingly. Searches cannot be performed based on idle gossip, malicious intent, or a hunch. In order to justify invading a student's privacy, a school leader must use prior knowledge, observation, or tips from students and staff, and information provided by a staff or an administrator must be weighted more than information provided by students.